Singanapalli Balramji. Uh, he is a designer, author, and a professor. And he'll speak to us today about the influence of Indian traditions on great world designers. I'll repeat that, the influence of Indian traditions on great world designers. Uh, Dr. Balram, if you can hear me, I request you yeah. to take it away from me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the lovely introduction. <clears throat> My show, I will stop. I would like to, before I start, I've sent a small request. Uh, as a tradition, we always have an invocation in Indian uh, events, so I would like to play that film as a prayer. There is a five-minute film, I've sent it. You can please play. It's called Lota. I will explain okay. why I'm showing it, why I'm, what is the reason later. Can you all see? Yes, I can see it. Uh, okay, great. great. Of all the objects we have seen and admired during our visit to India, the Lota, that simple vessel of everyday use, stands out as perhaps the greatest, the most beautiful. The village women have a process which, with the use of tamarind and ash, each day turns this brass into gold. But how would one go about designing a lota? First, one would have to shut out all preconceived ideas on the subject and then begin to consider factor after factor. The optimum amount of liquid to be fetched carried and poured and stored in a prescribed set of circumstances. The size and strength and gender of the hands, if hands, that would manipulate it. The way it is to be transported, head, hip, hand, basket or cart. The balance, the center of gravity. When empty, when full. Its balance when rotated for pouring. The fluid dynamics of the problem. Not only when pouring, but when filling and cleaning and under the complicated motions of head carrying, slow and fast. Its sculpture as it fits the palm of the hand the curve of the hip, its sculpture as complement to the rhythmic motion of walking or a static pose at the well. The relation of opening to volume in terms of storage uses and objects other than liquid. The size of the opening and inner contour in terms of cleaning. The texture inside and out, in terms of cleaning and feeling. Heat transfer. Can it be grasped if the liquid is hot? How pleasant does it feel? Eyes closed. Eyes open. How pleasant does it sound when it strikes another vessel, is set down on ground or stone, empty or full, or being poured into. What is the possible material? What is its cost in terms of working? What is its cost in terms of ultimate service? What kind of an investment does the material provide as product, as salvage? How will the material affect the contents? How will it look as the sun reflects off its surface? How does it feel to possess it, to sell it, to give it?
Before I start, I would like to thank Patili, uh, Indica Forum for inviting me and the August audience who were watching me right now. My only reason to stand before you is that my half a century of design teaching and design practice in the country. And my wish to talk on a subject which is not dealt with well enough, if at all. And that is design. Design is the youngest profession in the world. It has come hardly 100 years ago into the world. And it has come to India soon after. And because this is young, it's often there is a misnomer that design has come from the West. My idea of this talk is to dispel that myth and say that design is there with us for a long, 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 long time. The, the talk today also for a change will be a positive kind of influence Indian traditions have on the world over in various countries. And I will show you a few examples of that. Why did I show the film on Lota? And why I said it a prayer? It's a prayer because it is admired by none other than a person who is titled as designer of the 20th century. Charles Sims is supposed to be the world's best designer. And uh, I need a little background to be told about this for people who are not familiar. As we all know, after we won independence in 1947, there were plans drawn and the great visions have been kind of uh, made up. And one of the visions is to take India into development mode fast and modernize it. One of the modern uh, tools of modernism is design. How can we not have design? So the government at that time has approached the best designer of the world, Charles Sims, and he was invited with his wife to visit India and see what kind of design we should have, which would help our modernization efforts. Charles Sims came with Ray Eames, his wife, visited various centers in the, the craft centers and other production centers in the country, and uh, wisely talked to many intellectuals of at that time, the great country people and finally came to a conclusion. And he submitted a report which is surprisingly small. Can you ever imagine a feasibility report of 20 pages? The India report is all about 20 pages, typed on selected typewriter. At that time, there are no uh, computers and there is no uh, other typing equipment. It's tried copy, I have it here with me. Um, and the even more surprising is in that small 20 page report, two and a half pages have been just to praise the Lota. Why Charles Sims has picked up the Lota, that mundane Indian everyday object, the reason is there. If you remember, I will read it for you. It says that by the, the law sentence, which summarizes the whole report, because the report is actually not a feasibility report. It is a kind of approach paper. Uh, it, he says that by the new industrial design of India, an attitude be generated that will appraise and solve the problems of our coming times with the same tremendous service 
dignity and love that the Lota owed its time. Charles Sims looked at Lota as the epitome of Indian design, and that is the way we should go. He didn't even elaborate. I mean, this report doesn't have elaborate plans of the labor required, material required, finances required, and none of that. It simply says what kind of values we should carry on for. And this has been, the Lota has been picked up as a symbol of design and the importance of local culture. This is important. Local culture in modern design. Many people forget this importance of culture and the culture is actually the root of design. So it is not true that the design is, has come from West. Design has been there with us for a long time and Lotta is a living proof. After 20 years of the report was born, in 1979 to be exact, the report was, India report was given in 1958 and there was, ENID was born in 1961. Then in 79, one a historic event happened in the area of design education. First time, UNIDO and ICSID, UNIDO is United Nations Development Organization, and ICSID is International Council of Societies of Industrial Designers. Both these organizers are in global organizations. First time, hold hands together to hold the first meeting on a developing country. And that developing country they have chosen as India. So in 79, there was a meeting for which 37 country delegates have participated, including many Indians, but uh, Indians plus 37 country delegates. And some of them are legendary. Today, Victor Papanik from America, Dai Bonsepi from Germany, and uh, Yuri Solovio from Russia, John Reed from England, Kinzi Kwan from Japan, and uh, so on. They all have appreciated the lotta and the symbolic significance. And they have they have all signed a, a paper. You know, it is called as the Ahmedabad Declaration, which was later on became a, a touchstone for design. And that is another story I want to go into that. But of this, I wanted to emphasize the importance of Lota, which has influenced Charles Sims and all other countries, yeah, mainly the countries, poor countries and developing countries like India. Yeah. So design 
is an act of duty. Sir, could you uh, make it full screen? Full screen. Yeah. One second. Yes. Control L, sir. If you press Control L, it will come full screen. Yeah. Yes, sir. No, now you can hear. Yes, sir. You can yes. hear me also. Yeah, it's good now. Okay, great. Next. Next. So, these are delegates from various countries I just mentioned. No, not like okay. So this is the great man, Charles Sims. I have deliberately picked up this particular uh, photo. It shows his character. It's not just if I show just his uh, uh, head, it won't make much sense. This shows his playfulness. He used to call his office circus. Why circus? Because he says any design office should be, because design is doing, and it's very important, serious. At the same time, it is fun. So he said in circus, exactly like that happens. The circus is all fun, but it has to be very, very carefully planned and timed and synchronized. Otherwise, it would mean death to the players. So he used to say this, and this is the way he showed himself on a bookshelf because he's, he says that bookshelf is the uh, symbol of knowledge and uh, there's no better place than sitting there. Now, now this is, Lota itself is a kind of a surprising thing. There are two more surprises I find in the same report. The foreword, the foreword for this famous India report is written by who can you all imagine? It is written 5,000 years ago by a famous man called Vyadavyas, who wrote the Mahabharata and the Bhagavad Gita as part of that. What Charles Sims have done are familiar, all Hindus are familiar, karmanya vyadhikaraste, ma phalesh kadachinaha, ma karma khalayetu dhur, ma tiyaj sangostva karmani. This one, I was surprised when I first time saw the India report, because why did he put just karmanya vyadhikaraste, which we all know, and not a word trying to explain. 
he has left that deliberately to us. This is the actual uh, page which I have kind of photographed and a screenshot. That time typed on a selectronic type machine. It is interesting to know. He says that the spirit of the report lies in this forward. The dictionary says the forward is a The, is a kind of a forward should tell what the book is about and the glorification of the book. But how does this shloka glorifies what is the, what the book is going to say? And if you see in an implied way, he says that the effect of the report was lost but left to the changes in the context of society and the world, changes in the world during the time. If, if we look back at the India report today, you see, it is not what the AIMS report has envisaged. It is quite different because the technology changes have come and the social changes have come, political changes have come, many things which couldn't have imagined some uh, 60 years ago. But so Charles seems has wisely left it to this shloka, which explained that. There is another reason. The good designer, the government of India asked Charles seems to give them recommend recommendation, what kind of design activity and design education the country should have. And Charles seems cleverly left that without giving the details of integrity. And he said, it's all in the value system you inculcate. So it's like the good designer never takes the client's word on its surface. A good designer always takes what the client says and then interprets it. Like a doctor, you go to your doctor, the doctor examines and you have the fever, but he won't give fever medicine. The fever may be because of the uh, impending cancer or impending some other uh, disease you have. So the designers work exactly like that. They will take the symptoms which the, which the client says and then interpret it in themselves. And in that way, Charles Sims has interpreted that in form of a, a shloka from the Gita. He has given back to us the Gita to look into it, and you will find the answer. The third one is even more surprising. The third one, the report says that, that it refers to the Nataraja, who is the lord of Pandavaracha. And he talks about creative destruction. He says there are three India stands with three great advantages. And one of the first great advantages is, is creative destruction. It reads like this, India stands to face the change of the future world order with the three great advantages. The first one is that it has the tradition and the philosophy familiar with the meaning of creative destruction. Many, I'm surprised that many aestheticians and uh, scholars have not paid any attention to this particular sentence, which Charles Sims has mentioned. What he means is that the destruction is part of creation. And in which culture, then in Indian culture, that the world accepts death as, as to celebrate, and death is a part of birth. And Charles Sims has mentioned that, and he has put it there, yeah, that this is what India's advantage is. The 
Indians worship God of death not out of fear, but out of reverence and out of love, because India understands very clearly that the cycle of birth, life, and death, this, this, this cycle which governs the life and the universe, every breath is a bit of death. And this is, this we heard many times. And why is he talks about in it, why is it so important? It is so important because we talk about sustainability. What is sustainability? Sustainability is important. That is because you're only not looking at the destruction, but you are only looking at the uh, construction. You're only looking at the, the creation. It's only a French philosopher called Jacques Derrida made waves in the world, in the art world particularly, by talking about deconstruction. But India has this since the ancient times, but we have almost forgotten about it. And now we all lamenting about sustainability as a design world is particularly is talking all the time about sustainable fashion, sustainable products, sustainable everything. It is becoming a bank world. It is no wonder, you see the negative is always part of positive. Negative doesn't exist without positive. So no wonder that the zero or nothingness has been given to the world by our culture. The third I will come to Bauhaus, which is an epitome of modern design education. It just started in 1919. And uh, even today, after 100 years, we, we still refer to and follow some of the syllabuses and curriculum of Bauhaus education. And many old schools owe it to Bauhaus. But I'm not going to tell about that, but I want to tell something else, which Bauhaus has followed. Bauhaus, one of the Bauhaus teachers called Johannes Eaton, who was coordinating the most important uh, year in the four-year program of uh, education, design education, which is a foundation year. Foundation year is the key uh, years in education, in any school of education. Eaton came to India and he was so impressed by how the traditional education and traditional methods of developing mind, body, and yeah, soul. And he was particularly attracted to pranayama, breathing control, and meditation, dhyanam, to uh, uh, enhance your mental and spiritual abilities. When he went back to Bauhaus, he implemented it and made it part of the curriculum at Bauhaus. So here is John Seaton, Meditation in Modern Education. And he talked about this in 1919 in so many years ago. I'm unfortunately, I yet have to see it in design schools in India. After that, we will come to India. We have often believed that design education started with National Institute of Design in Ahmedabad, which is not so. The Nobel laureate, our only Nobel laureate in literature so far, Mindana Tagore, who got his Nobel in 1913, he, when he came to India after visiting Bauhaus, he started in Shantini Ketan Bharati with the idea of starting a, a designer education there, but not in the way Bauhaus has started. So he came, he started Shilpa Sadhana, which I think he has this before. He started that for educating the crafts, which India is very rich about. But along with it, something else has happened. 
it has influenced Bauhaus teachers themselves. And one of them was invited to India. Her name is Stella Kramrish. She, when she came here, she fell in love with Indian culture and she realized how important is the tradition and culture in design. And then she realized also why such a rich culture is not known outside. And she realized that language is one barrier. Most of the treatises were wonderful, but they're only in Sanskrit. And uh, there are no English translations available. So this lady was so impressed and uh, wanted to do this great service to the world. So she learned Sanskrit, then she's translated Vishnu Dharmotara, third khanda of Vishnu Dharmotara, which is related to the Indian tradition of painting. And today, that is the only English translation we have to go and it's, I would like to everybody to know about it. But it took me at least 30 years before I even know about Vishnu Dharmotara. I went all the way to Royal College of Art London in uh, you know early years, my early studies. But at that time, I didn't know that such a great book existed in India itself. So this is our sad story. Now, I will go to another great international center in uh, Pondicherry. Our Villa Ashram has got this spiritual center used to be headed by Sri Aurobindo and mother. This has kind of is a home for many, many people from many, many countries. But what I would like to show here is the design aspect, how design was affected by Swami Aurobindo and the, his philosophy. One of his philosophies reality is reality is omnipresent means there is reality everywhere. One Japanese American architect called George Nakashima visited, happened to visit Arvind Ashram way back during the World War times in 1942 to design their hostels. But he was so enamored by and uh, taken over by the philosophy of Aurobindo. Then he decided that his life, he changed his whole life. He decided to live in those principles, life divine. And he, all his life, he has become from architecture. He left architecture and shifted to furniture design, that too with solid wood. And wood, what kind of wood? Non-violent, yeah, techniques means he never uses. If you have, if you see Nakashima's work, wooden furniture, he never uses the glue. He never uses the nail. He never uses the any of these violence on this because he believes that, like every material has a soul, even wood also has this soul. It is very. It looks very poetic and uh, surreal, but he really believed so. And he is working, even today his office is there, he is no more, but his office is there in America. They still follow his principle. And this is one furniture he made when he came to National Institute of Design and stayed there. And he wrote this book called The Soul of a Tree. Does tree has a soul? Nakashima believes it has, and you have to be sensitive. This is echoes so much. Others may not believe in other countries, but in India we should believe because he asked in his tapati, the temple builders, the traditional temple builders in India, and they will tell you, I know a few of them, they will tell you that yes, they have a soul and you have to listen to them. Ganapati Stapati was talking the, the great uh, Stapati of uh, Mahabalipuram. He was talking in a video. He was telling that 
This stone will speak to you. If you touch it, it will tell you what it want to become. And that is how it, it, it looks very poetic and not real. But actually, it is real. They believe and they will, they have, they, they have been guided by this uh, belief in their life and their work. Now we will come to <coughs> architecture. We all have kind of known about the Delhi and the buildings of Delhi, it's a colonial architecture. And Sir Edwin Luton is one great man who has kind of made all those buildings. And one thing is, what is Indianness in it? Sir Edwin Luton is very conscious of having some Indianness in those buildings. So what he did is he took inspiration from Sanchi Stupa in Bihar, the Buddhist architecture, and he kind of adopted that in his buildings. What you are seeing here is the Rashtrapati Bhavan, and uh, many other buildings have kind of motive. Now we will go to another one. My favorite, uh, there is a small background you should know. In the, soon after the independence and before that, there were no design schools in India and there are no design teachers either. So many of the young people have been sent abroad, young architects, that is, maybe Doshi, Thals, Korea, and many of us, many designers too. And it is kind of, expected that they learn the techniques of design and come back to India and serve India. But one aspect is not realized that they study the Western ways of doing it, Western methods of doing it, Western, Western principles of aesthetics. But there is a problem with their using them to the Indian uh, local needs. Laurie Baker is one person who recognized that and realized, and he always lamented the Indian architects and designers falling into the trap of using Western methods, however great they are, in India. And we have even called Western designers, Western architects, to India to create some great monuments. And uh, Laurie Baker was very upset about it but particularly Indian architects and Indian designers uh, doing buildings in the Western way, where the conditions are very different, where cold is predominant, whereas in tropical countries like India, the heat is so predominant. So Laurie Baker happened to come to India, then he made it his, his country. He stayed here till his, life, till his death. And when he went to Patnavakram, Palace in Tamil Nadu, Tamil Nadu Kerala border. He was so impressed. This ancient building was so cool, even with the mid summer. So he said, This is what Indian architects should know. So he championed from then onwards till his death, he championed low cost architecture using exposed brick, mud walls, mud roof, uh, thatched roof and uh, in rat trap wall, many of these techniques which are which we have almost forgotten in reference to cement and glass and all that. But see this building is so beautiful using exposed brick. And this is done by Laurie Baker. And uh, at the low cost because, why low cost? Because only then you can, it can be afforded by poor people in this country. And also they know, and it becomes, the cost will be low because if you use the local uh, local stone, local mud, local uh, bamboo and uh, jute and local materials. So naturally it will be low cost. And not only that it is so successful in India, he has got a great following of young architects, but abroad everywhere, no low cost housing is kind of uh, follows Lori Baker's low cost architecture principles. With that, I would like to conclude my presentation.
and in saying, I would say the blue identity of India is not superficial, but it is our reality. And uh, yeah, and in the end, you see, their way, our way, I, this is not a value judgment. I think it is AST value judgments are wrong. We say, I always used to, when I was a young child, I used to see films. I was a film enthusiast, even now. We always used to end our films with Shubham. And all the Western films, I'm also very, I've seen many international Western films. They all end with the end. You see, I'm not saying any value judgments, but I say Shubham sounds much, wishing everybody well, sounds much more polite than saying that go. In Andhra, I'm from Andhra. In Telugu, we never say, there is no word to say. If, somebody, if you are leaving somebody and say farewell, you don't say I'm going. You say, I'm coming back. You never say welcome. No, that is impolite. And the same way, Shubham, we say our ending. And uh, the end, others say. So our their ways and our ways. So with this, I want to say Shubham to everyone. And end this and thank you for inviting me to this. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Balara, for uh, your talk, for this presentation. Uh, it was wonderful to have both Padmini ji and you uh, back to back in this conference.